You can pop up the next slide, Doug. Uh, your host tonight. So tonight your hosts are myself. I'm Audra. I'm a, a travel designer with Africa Endeavors. Uh, and I'll be joined tonight by my colleague Candace, um, who has traveled through Rwanda twice, as well as our special guest tonight, which is Christy Angelotti from Singida. Um, both Christy and Candace traveled through Rwanda earlier this year in January, and will be bringing some of their amazing experiences virtually to you guys tonight. Uh, just a bit about us. Um, so for some of you who don't know Africa Endeavors, uh, we are very passionate about travel to Africa. Um, as a team, we have a myriad of experiences um, from witnessing the Great Migration, swimming in the Devil's Pool, diving in Zanzibar, and as tonight, uh, gorilla trekking and all the unique experiences in Rwanda. Um, as some of you may know, but as some of you might not know, we customize each and every trip uh, and all the lodges and places we recommend are going to be top notch and they do follow conservation and sustainable travel guidelines such as Singida. Ultimately, our goal is to help you design the most life changing trip to Africa. Um, our agenda. So as to, uh, for tonight, uh, Candace recently traveled to Rwanda, like I said earlier this year. So she'll give us a recap of her experiences, as well as give you a great overview how Rwanda during this time can be a one-stop destination. Um, we'll then hear from the lovely Christy, um, who will give us a really great virtual insight to one of Singida's newest lodges, Kutanda, and also touch a little bit about Tanzania. Um, and then finally, we'll, like I said, we'll have a Q&A at the very end. So if you do have any questions and you're new to this, just pop your questions in the chat on the right. Um, we'll kind of be monitoring that throughout and then we'll kind of address them at the end. Um, and again, we'll also just be recording this webinar. So with that, I'll kick it off to Candace um, and off you go. Thanks everyone for joining. I'm Candace. Um, just really quickly, I don't know if anybody noticed my photo in the host slide, but I just wanted to say that those cows are one of my favorite things I've ever seen in my life. Um, they are in Nienza, which is at the King's Palace, and they're basically, even though Rwanda doesn't have a king anymore, these they preserve the tradition. I'm not talking about that tonight, but I just want to say that if I die and come back in something, I want it to be one of those cows because they have the best life. Um, so flash forward, we're gonna talk about a few different areas um, in Rwanda that I was lucky enough to visit in January. Um, Akagera National Park in the north, Nyangwe National Park in the south. Doug, can you go back? Thank you. Um, Lake Kivu, we're gonna to touch on, then of, of course, Volcanoes National Park, um, which is the most famous destination in all of Rwanda. Um, Rwanda is located in Central East Africa, the capital is Kigali, um, and it's also the gateway in and out of the country, um, unless you're driving in from Uganda. US dollars are widely accepted. Um, it's called like the springtime country, um, and year round it has really lovely weather, though they do have a dry season and a wet season or a rainy season. The dry season runs from June through September, um, and the shorter dry season is December through February. Um, and that's really the best time. Those are the best times to go to Rwanda, even though you can go year round, just keep in mind your tracks will get a little muddier <laughs> during that wet season. Um, if you are in Rwanda, one thing to keep in mind through November to May, they and you spend three or more days and visit one more than one national park, uh, you could qualify for a discount at Gorilla Permit. Um, they're normally $1,500 and they actually are discounted 30%. So that's a pretty good deal. Just a couple other touch points. Um, visa on arrival, it's 50 US dollars. That's still what they're doing currently. Um, so it's quite easy to transit through. Um, it's easy to get there. There's multiple airlines that offer flights from the US with connections through Europe, Middle East, or even other parts of Africa. Um, also, Rwanda is the safest country in Africa and the fifth safest country in the world, just in case anybody had any issues about that. Um, so we're gonna start in Kigali, which is the capital. Most visitors stay about one to three days, um, but really from my last trip there, it was there's so much to see and do, it's definitely worth extending. Um, in addition to the genocide museum, which is really important to do, and I think it's great to do it first, because you do see where the country has been and you can see where it is now. Um, there are also fantastic markets, 
Um, I got these awesome bomber jackets made. You can basically get measured custom clothes and they're made out of uh, Katenge, which is a traditional African fabric. But it's also a great place to pick up souvenirs and meet some of the locals. I still keep in, I still WhatsApp with Passy, my guy who designed my jacket back in January. So it's been good to kind of keep in touch with him during this whole COVID um, issue. There are also art and food tours. There's coffee tasting classes, as you can see pictured here. Um, there's walking tours through the Muslim community, which is one of the oldest cities in the neighborhood. And there's fascinating stories about how they helped protect people, um, the Tutsis during the genocide. Um, and then um, there's cooking classes with Amanitha, who's pictured here. She is a total character. Um, she cooks the most amazing food in this traditional way. Um, so you can learn all about that and then have lunch in her home. So it's a real kind of local experience. Um, so yeah, definitely one to three nights in Kigali. It is a really vibrant, clean, safe city and the people are amazing. So next up, we've got Akagera National Park. This park was founded in 1934, um, but most of the game unfortunately was poached out during the genocide. So um, the government, the Rwanda Development Board has been working with African parks to bring the game back. And last year, um, Wilderness Safari opened a really awesome six tented camp. Um, so it really has accommodation now that will appeal to the international market. Um, and we stayed there in January. We had amazing weather. This is Alphonse, he's a local and was our guide. Um, so it's about 2.5 hour drive, easy drive, paved tarmac road from Kigali or a 20 minute helicopter ride. It's home to big five, 500 bird species. The activities include safari drives, walking safaris. There's a beautiful lake where you can do boating safaris. Um, I had the most epic leopard sighting there with two males trying to fight over mating with a female and also her kill. And we sat there for about three hours. It was incredible. There's also um, amazing black rhino sightings, which if any of you have been to Africa, you know those are so difficult because they're always buried in the bush and they're skittish and run away. Um, but through the African Parks Program, they actually took um, a couple of female rhinos from uh, zoo up in Europe. I think it was the Czech Republic. So they're very habituated to humans. So they just walked right up to the vehicle and were curious. So it was pretty amazing. I'd never, in all my times to Africa, I've never seen one that close. Um, so that's Akagera. It's very different from the rest of Rwanda. As you can see, it's very flat and it's sort of, they, they compare it to like a savanna. So, or it is a savanna, compare it to like the Serengeti. So that's where you would go for your traditional safari experience. Um, and we did see the big five um, as well as a bunch of different birds and everything like that. So it was quite spectacular. Um, next slide, Doug. So then moving down to the south, you have Nyangwe National Park. Um, this is in the southwestern portion of the country and it's about four hours from Kigali um, or a helicopter transfer as well. There are regular scheduled commercial flights on Rwanda Air. There will be hopefully um, once the demand meets, but in the past there was, and the flight's about one hour. So just a little bit about this area. This is a traditional tea growing area. Um, it's also home to 13 primate species. And this is where you go to do chimpanzee trekking or colobus monkey trekking. There's also a really beautiful, um, like, oh gosh, what I'm, what's the uh, term I'm looking for? It's basically like a boardwalk, a tree walk that you can do through the park. Um, and it's also an international important birder area for all you birders out there. So this is a picture of the one and only Nyungwe. It's the new lodge that they built there. Um, it's located on a tea plantation. It's absolutely beautiful. They have a great spa. It's a great place to sort of end a trip after you've done your trekking and just kind of want to relax. Um, one thing, and there's a bunch of other activities to do there as well, but they do employ all locals here. And the goal is to turn the um, tea plantation eventually into a, a co-op that's owned by the community. So um, they're really community focused, which is wonderful. Um, moving on, you've got Lake Kivu. So this is sort of the Rwanda's beachside region, just kind of driving in. It, it just reminded me of like a Lake Como. I don't know why I've never actually even been to Lake Como, but it is like this beautiful lake with these rolling hills and mountains that surround it. Um, it's about three hours from Kigali and it's about one and a half hours from Volcanoes National Park, which I'll talk about next. Um, 
And so it's a really good destination to sort of decompress, but there's also kayaking, mountain biking, there's the Congo Nile Trail where you can do hiking, multi-day cycling. Um, it really just is a really beautiful, beautiful, vibrant area with stunning sunsets when I was there. Everybody was playing beach volleyball and hanging out, um, having sundowners. It just has this really good resort feel to it. Right now, the hotel accommodation is only in the three star range. So um, it's totally fine, but you're not going to get the likes of Singido or <laughs> one and only there. Um, Lake Kivu or the Kivu Queen is launching in, I think, March of next year. And that's actually a luxury houseboat. So I don't know if any of you have heard of the Zambezi Queen or the Joey Princess, but that's actually the sister boat. So it'll be a similar, um, a similar style and accommodation. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that come online. Um, next slide. This is, I'm just gonna briefly, briefly touch on Gishwatu Makoro because it's not yet open. Um, it's pretty close to Kigali and sort of sits on the way between Lake Kivu and Volcano. So if you don't have time to make it all the way to Nyungwe and you want to do chip tracking, they're in the process of habituating the chimpanzees, golden monkeys, and African blue monkeys. So that will be this area. Um, also bird watching and nature, nature walks will be available there. Um, and wilderness, which has the um, Mugashi up in Akagera National Park or off are opening a similar style camp. So that's really exciting and they should be opening next year. Um, and last but not least, Volcanoes National Park, which Christy will expand on, but I just wanted to briefly touch on. This is the most famous park in Rwanda um, and home, home to the mountain gorillas. Um, it's about 2.5 hours drive from Kigali or a 20 minute helicopter ride. Um, Besides gorilla tracking though, there's also a feast of activities you can do up here. You can golden monkey track, there's multi-day hikes, there's canoeing, mountain biking, birding. Um, there's also multi-day, the Bahanga Eco Park, the Basoke um, Crater Lake, and the Diane Fossey Tomb Trail are all day hikes available in that area. So as you can see there, Oh, Rwanda used to be just sort of a in and out three days do gorillas, but there's so much to see and do in this country and it's so beautiful and the people are so amazing. Um, it's definitely worth if you're thinking about going extending your stay um, and having a look at some of these other areas. So I think the last slide I'm just gonna to move on into um, Singida Kwatanda. I'm just gonna show you I was lucky enough to actually hike with the Kwatanda group. Um, it is the largest group family in Rwanda and obviously the namesake for Singida. Um, and featured in this video is Kataza, who is very naughty, but it's a little hard to see and I apologize, but I just laugh every time I see this video. So I wanted to share it with you all. That's Kataza. Oh, I got grilled. <laughs> so he's a very naughty teenage boy. Um, after this, he was abusing one of his other siblings. And the reason he's doing that is because the silverback is on the other side of the tree and can't see him misbehave. But he's quite a character. And as you can see, the gorillas don't really mind the um, artificial barriers us humans try and put up. They will just come and go as they please. So that's it for me. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much for sharing that, Candace, and for the awesome overview. If anyone does any questions, pop it in the chat, but I'm sure Candace will be happy to chat to anyone more about her um, experiences. And you're so right, how cute and naughty is um, Kataza. Um, as uh, Candace did, didn't mention, but she has stayed at Singida Kutanda. So for those of you who don't know, um, Singida's Lodges, they have set the bar for experience, experiential luxury for Africa. It's a really top notch. Uh, and we're really lucky, like I said before, to be joined by Christy, who represents Singita Lodges. So welcome, Christy. Thanks for joining us. Um, Christy, for all of our attendees, can you start by giving us an overview of what's currently going on with Singita? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for joining today, everybody. And thanks, Africa Endeavors, for putting this together. Um, before we get into the experiences and the lodges that we have in Rwanda, I wanted to show you the map of where Singida is located in case you're not that familiar. So at Singida, we're a luxury collection of safari lodges and camps. And you can find us in four countries in Africa. So we're in South Africa, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and Rwanda, which is what we're going to talk about today. And essentially we're 298 beds on a million acres of land. So pretty massive footprint um, on the continent of Africa. And you'll only find us in exclusive private concessions and pristine pieces of land on the continent. Next slide, please. So everything we do at Singida revolves around this 100 year conservation purpose we have, which is what we're committed to. So our plans are to preserve and protect large areas of African wilderness for future generations. And our conservation approach is really a three pronged one. If you could move to the next slide, I'll show you the three pillars um, of our conservation. So we focus on biodiversity, which is restoring land to its natural habitat. So wildlife species can grow and flourish and replenish their populations. And then sustainability, um, we do everything in our power to create sustainable lodges, eliminate you know, things like plastic water bottles, use locally sourced materials and produce. Um, and you'll find that reflected in all of the countries that we operate. And then we also work very closely with the local communities um, in each of the countries in Africa. So we work on really childhood education, environmental education, and, envir um, and uh, enterprise development. So we have farmers co-ops where we buy local produce, um, serving it, you know, farm to table, fresh, organic, and um, buying, you know, large quantities of local produce from uh, our community partners. Next slide, please. So here is where we're located. If you can see um, on the map there where the pin is, uh, we're about two and a half hours by road transfer from Kigali, which what Candice mentioned is where you'll fly into um, when you enter Rwanda. If you don't mind a little road trip, I can't encourage enough um, driving to the lodge or, you know, getting a, a ground transfer because Rwanda is the land of a thousand hills. The scenery is stunning, green, lush, and it's just a really fun drive. You see people walking up and down the side of the road, lots of buzz, lots of industry, lots of activity, um, and it's just breathtaking. But if you don't want to do the two and a half hour ground transfer, you can always do a really quick helicopter flip over to the lodges to begin your journey. So um, Rwanda is one of the few countries in Africa and, and the planet essentially that's open. The borders are open and including to American guests. So if you want to get away, you can actually go to Rwanda right now. Um, we've been open, a soft open in July for private charters. And since August, commercial flights have um, begun service. So we're so excited to be receiving guests again. Um, we've even gotten some new recent last minute bookings from people that just want to get away. Um, you could cross the border you can easily go on a safari in Rwanda and Tanzania right now if you want. So here's the entry protocols. Um, they are updated from time to time, but here's the latest as of about mid-August. So you have to get a negative COVID-19 PCR test within five days or 120 hours of your departure. So you fly into Kigali, and then once you arrive, you're quarantined at one of about 17 different Kigali hotels that you choose. And you're quarantined for about 24 hours while you take the COVID test, you wait for the results. Um, they're trying to fast track the international um, tests and hopefully you'll get it in about eight to 12 hours. So quicker than that 24 hours, but designate at least 24 hours. You wait for the negative result. Once you get that, you're free to go and travel around Rwanda. Um, while you wait it out, you can rest from that long flight, order contact, contactless room service and just get ready for your big African adventure. Um, God forbid you test positive on arrival, you would get immediate medical attention or you could fly back home abiding by medevac protocols. So of course we um, encourage travel insurance for anybody that travels right now. But I have a few, a few colleagues that um, have just crossed over the border and entered Rwanda and they said it was really well organized. They felt a real strong sense of, um, of welcoming spirit uh, from the Rwandese people. Um, and they said it was pretty seamless. So overall process seems pretty easy and definitely doable. 
That's awesome, Christy. Um, and like Candace also mentioned earlier about Kigali, it really does work well, um, even with the current environment, to be able to kind of stay put before you kind of get out on those extra adventures. Um, and I know you're going to touch on two of your accommodations um, in just a second, but uh, just a little bit background of when Singita in Rwanda opened and just tell us a little bit more about how they got their names, the property. All right. So we actually just opened uh, last August. So we've been open just over a year aside from, you know, the past few months, but um, we are open again. And the origin story is really cool. So a few, um, a few years prior to opening, President Kagame of Rwanda called our founder, Luke Bales, and said, hey, are you interested in opening a lodge in Rwanda? We'd really love to have Singida here. Um, we think that Singida is in line with the tourism experience that we can offer in Rwanda. Um, so are you interested? Um, thankfully, Luke took him up on that offer, took a helicopter around um, the area, around Volcanoes National Park, and surveyed the land and found this stunning piece of land that you're looking at right now. So our lodges look out at the three volcanoes that are the gorilla's habitat. And everywhere you look from inside your rooms and outside, you're facing those volcanoes. Um, so, you know, fast forward to today, that's where we're located. Um, and that's how we came to open the newest lodges in Singita's collection. And as Candace mentioned, um, Quitanda Lodge and Kataza House are named after the Quitanda family, which um, was named after a silverback who died uh, a few years ago at the age of 40 and actually emigrated from the DRC to Rwanda um, and started his family there. Um, so conservation um, is really a big part of what we do. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that here as well. So um, really our primary motivation for operating in Rwanda is to play a key role in the conservation and preservation of the gorilla species. Um, there are just over a thousand now and the population has increased over the past decade or so. So um, the permit fees and conservation efforts have definitely been working. Um, and our conservation efforts focus on ensuring that the area is successfully restored through active reforestation, um, locally sourced indigenous, indigenous trees are planted, and we act as a critical buffer between the park and the agricultural lands and the surrounding villages. So our goal ultimately is to expand the gorilla's habitat. Um, and that's something that we're you know, tirelessly doing and the vision for the future would be to trek right out of the Singita, Kutanda, and Kataza House Lodges right um, into the mountains and the volcanoes um, to start your trek. So oh, amazing. And then just a little, yeah, perfect. So just a little bit more about the conservation efforts there that are kind of jumping up on your screen. Yeah, so we've spent um, two million nearly um, on investments in the local communities. Um, we employ mostly people from Rwanda. Um, our building materials are locally sourced um, and we create sustainably designed lodges as well, which is something you'll see across the entire Singita collection. Um, and you know, we're not just conserving um, mountain gorillas here. There are forest elephants that we occasionally see from time to time around the lodges. Um, there are also buffalo that you can occasionally see um, roaming around. And the occasional um, cat species, there was a caracal found um, on one of our hidden cameras from, uh, from a few weeks ago, which was pretty exciting for everybody. They hadn't been spotted uh, pretty much ever <laughs> in the region. Um, so it's really cool to see, um, you know, the land being protected and other species as well, including bird life and just general Rwandese uh, flora and fauna. Amazing, amazing. Um, quite perfect. And can you just tell us a little bit about the highlights of each of the lodges? Yeah, so the, our lodges in Rwanda were built to be nurturing spaces and they're all centered around contemplating um, and really just taking in that transformative experience of coming face to face with the mountain gorillas. So Kwitanda Lodge is just eight rooms and the interiors emphasize emphasize local design with handcrafted details, layered textures and colors. And here you can see that floor to ceiling windows and you'll see that reflected throughout the entire lodge. Um, in the next slide, you'll see the bar. That's a lovely place to wake up in the morning and get a fresh latte or a green juice to enjoy before you go out on your trek. We also have a trekking gear room um, where you can rent a variety of, um, of gear from us or essentially use it. Trekking poles, backpacks, jackets, gaiters, all that rainproof gear that you really don't want to travel with around when you have a 35 pound weight limit um, on your bush flights between Africa, African destinations. 
So we also bring the spa to you so you don't have to be walking around outside in case it's cold, misty, or rainy. Um, we have in-room massage tables in each of the rooms, in each of our bathrooms, and it wouldn't be a Sinkita Lodge if you didn't have a luxurious bathtub overlooking pristine African wilderness. And then high-end creative food is really a core part of the Singita experience. So our chefs really go above and beyond to tailor each meal to your individual preferences. So if you're a vegan, if you're gluten-free, no worries. We can accommodate you know, any range of, um, of food preferences. And you can always expect to find light, seasonal, healthy, local, and fresh farm-to-table organic menu options. And here's my favorite part. Um, each of our suites has an outdoor heated plunge pool with an outdoor fireplace um, with views of those volcanoes. So really, this is the place that you want to go after your trek. Maybe pop in a little massage in your room when you get done with the trek and then enjoy um, the heated plunge pools. So if you're looking for a more private experience, just next door to Quitanda Lodge is our villa and that's private use only. It's called Kataza House and it's a four bedroom villa. So it works for up to eight people. And both lodges are located uh, less than 10 minutes from park headquarters, which is where you meet to get assigned to your gorilla trekking family and start the journey um, for your trek. And then at Kataza House, you'll find two heated plunge pools. We also have in and outdoor fireplaces. There's a wine cellar, a fitness center. There's an interactive kitchen in case you want to learn about more about local Rwandese cuisine. And there's a cinema in case you want to pop in Gorillas in the Mist the night before your trek or the night after um, and watch it in Rwanda. So the villa also will have a full staff um, and there's a farm to table food journey um, and you'll eat, be finding fresh produce from our on-site gardens as well. So I'm pretty happy to say that 2021 is looking quite busy. Um, our lodges are small. Um, we've had a lot of guests that were supposed to travel this year postpone a lot of new bookings. Um, so um, we're pretty excited for next year. So do keep that in mind. Space is limited um, across our lodges. That's awesome. Yeah, just get people booking already. Those are such amazing accommodations. So I, I, sorry, I'm going to impromptu just add one thing in that I learned when I was staying at Singita, besides the fact that I want to live there. Um, <laughs> if you guys have a family that wants to go there and you book a private trek, you get to pick your family. And if you pick Quitanda, you can actually just, they'll register you at Kataza house and you can just walk out from your front lawn. So that's pretty sweet. <laughs> That's amazing, Candace, and I know that was your highlight, so that's so cool. Um, so if you aren't gorilla tracking, and if you aren't just staying at the lodge, because I can see why you'd want to do that, what else is there to do? So much to do. Um, so many people try to pop in for a two-night stay. Definitely not long enough. There are tons of other things to do. So most guests will do at least one gorilla trek, but some guests will do multiple, um, two or even more if they really want to see the gorillas. It's one of those things where you think that you'll do it once in a lifetime and you do your one trek, but every trek is different. Every experience is different. All the behavior is different and every family is different. So you can easily do more than one trek, but Certainly not the only thing to do. Um, you can also go golden monkey trekking. Um, we also um, have a small village called Gasura, which is about 30 minutes from the lodge. So you can visit um, the village and learn about local Rwandese cultural experiences. Um, another thing we can do is arrange for Akarabo nursery walks. So when you do this, a chef will accompany you through the nursery, teach you about what's growing there, and then most of the produce will be used to um, create the food that you're eating when you get back to the lodges. Um, now, if, you, uh, if you're not done hiking yet, after the gorillas and the golden monkeys, you can hike to, um, the Muso through the Musanze Caves, to a crater lake, to Diane Fossey's grave. Um, we can also visit, um, take you to nearby local markets, which are pretty fun to do. And if you don't want to go anywhere, you can hang out at the lodge, get spa, um, spa treatments. We also offer tree planting, yoga, cooking, basket weaving. And you can take a bike ride around the local farms or even just take a walk around around um, and look at the local villages. As Candace mentioned, um, Rwanda is just such a safe and friendly country. Now, this is where you'll want to spend some time either before or after your trek. This is our conservation room. So this is an interactive space that has all kinds of historical um, 
historical documents, pictures, stats about the history of gorilla trekking in Rwanda, about Diane Fossey's efforts, about the local flora and fauna. Um, and if you're a photographer, you can also use um, these IMAX to edit your photos. So if you want to post them right away the night of your trek, um, you can do a little work on your photos right then and there at the lodge. I am not surprised, Candace, you want to be living there. That is amazing. Um, Christy, I know that since you've also been, what is your uh, personal favorite experience or encounter? Well well, this will come as probably no surprise to anybody, but for me, nothing compares to gorilla trekking. Um, not just seeing the gorillas, but it's the entire experience. So when you start the trek, you're going to most likely hike through farms on your way to enter Volcanoes National Park. You're going to be waving at kids. You're going to be navigating through what can be pretty dense terrain. And there's just a general surreal feeling of walking through a misty rainforest in the middle of Africa. And then that first second when you spot the gorillas, it's one of those feelings that will stay with you for the rest of your life. Um, the first time I went in 2016, um, a little curious two-year-old gorilla tapped me on the shoulder. And uh, this was before, you know, social distancing was a thing. And I grabbed this selfie just two seconds before he tapped me when he was, had his little finger out to tap me, which you could see in the next photo. There he is. So you could see his little finger. He just tapped me right on the shoulder. Um, it was the coolest experience. And then my most recent trek, I feel so blessed to have gone uh, in January of this year. We trekked to the Pablo group, and that was a family of 25 with three silverbacks. We actually saw a baby gorilla beating his chest and rolling around on the ground, um, and it was just magical. When the trek ended, it seemed like the entire village was there just waiting to say hi to us and ask us about our trek. Um, so, you know, for me, gorilla trekking is really just the holy grail of travel adventures in Africa. And at the end of the day, you get to contribute, you know, with your permit fee to the conservation um, of the mountain gorillas. And if you're staying with us at Kwatanda, you could be sitting in your heated plunge pool after that trek, enjoying a nice glass of Chenin Blanc, um, like I was doing in January. <laughs> um, and now we have... Um, our general manager, Lydia Nazayo, sent um, a video message. So it's the middle of the night in Rwanda and she actually has guests in the lodge right now, but she wanted to say hi to all of you guys. So she sent this video for us to share. Good afternoon, Africa Endeavors. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to Rwanda, to Singita Volcanoes National Park, where we are right now. Rwanda has reopened for tourism since uh, 1st of August for international travelers. And it's really been a seamless experience. The government of Rwanda has put in place measures in order to ensure that the guests who come in the country are safe, as well as the staff, and finally the gorillas um, are safe as well. The gorillas live in the Volcanoes National Park, which is just behind me, where you see these big trees, and you can hear the sound of the frogs, which are welcoming you as well to Rwanda. As you see, the view here where we are at the lodge is really, really beautiful and relaxing. It's a really good way to connect with nature once again and to really pose, which we all need in these times. During the time of lockdown, what we have done at the lodge has really been to think of the guest experience. We've thought of what will the guest be needing in the future post COVID. And we know that guests have been craving family times, being together, reconnect with nature, and this is something that we are able to offer at Singita. As Tanzania is close by, obviously it's very easy to combine a Singita trip between Tanzania and between Rwanda, which offers completely different landscapes and very different safari experience. We truly hope that we'll be able to welcome you to our property very soon, and in the meantime, we say see you soon. That's amazing. And Lydia's so right. So just a great place to sounds like to pause, to spend some time with family. And it sounds like people are already visiting with this background noise. So also to see uh, see Rwanda that way. Um, like Lydia mentioned, Christy, um, you, it is combinable with Tanzania. So we did hear Tanzania is now open. So can you just give us a little overview about some of your Tanzania properties? Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
Tanzania um, and Rwanda make a great combo and you could go to either country and cross the borders tomorrow if you wanted. So um, we're really, really excited to be receiving guests again in both regions. Um, so you'll find us in two regions in the Serengeti in Tanzania. So we're in the Grumeti concession and then up in Lamai, um, right next to the Mara River. So it's pretty easy to get to our lodges in Tanzania from Rwanda. Um, you get back to Kigali and then you can either take that ground transfer, that scenic ground transfer we mentioned, or a quick helicopter flight. And then it's about an hour and a half total time to fly to Gurmeti, Tanzania. So you take a custom stop over from Kigali. Um, you generally stop in Mwanza, get your passport stamped, and then you fly directly into um, our reserves in Gurmeti on a small bush flight. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you're all more than familiar with the Serengeti, but the game viewing is just incredible. Um, we are in the northern Serengeti, and I'll show you a map of where we're located. So if you can see where all the pins are in the northern Serengeti, what you're looking at right here is the Serengeti Mara ecosystem. And that dark reserve with all the pins in it, that is Singita Grumeti. And this is exclusive to Singita. So you'll just find our three lodges and two villas there. Um, and if you look at this map closely, you'll see the Kenyan border. And just across the border, you'll see the Maasai Mara game reserve. Our concession Grumeti is nearly the size of the entire Maasai Mara. And our concession has about 150 beds. The Maasai Mara has 5,000. So, so exclusive and uh, just incredible game viewing. So you'll go on twice daily game drives. Um, you'll expect to see quite a lot of wildlife. The game viewing is year round. Um, we can arrange for hot air balloons over the Serengeti as well. And you can expect to see um, some exciting sightings and there are lots and lots of lions in the reserve. So, um, Sasakwa is our flagship lodge and it sits up on top of Sasakwa Hill with 360 degree sweeping views of the Serengeti. And each of the rooms has private heated outdoor plunge pools and it's built in the Edwardian Manor style. And then if your dream is to sleep under canvas, which is my favorite way to go on safari, then Sabora Tented Camp is probably what you're looking for. So Sabor has been closed for massive redesign um, and it's going to reopen at the end of this month with a completely new look and feel. Um, the old Sabora was out of Africa style and the new Sabora is gonna be modern romantic adventure tented camp with canvas touches and campaign furniture. And we're keeping the image as a surprise until we open at the end of the month. And then if you want the best of both worlds, check out Faru Faru. So Faru Faru is modern geometric African shapes and fabrics. It sits right next to the Grumeti River and it has more bush-like terrain. Um, and my, one of my favorite things about Faru Faru is here. So you have the feeling of a tented camp and you can even get the sounds, but it's actually in a lodge. So you can see the roof, it looks tented, but it's a lodge. And then those two windows opposite the bed, you have a little remote next to your bed, opens those windows, brings a screen down, and then boom, you're sleeping right with the sounds of those hippos that are living in the Grumeti River uh, right below your room. There's an indoor bathtub here and outdoor showers as well. So most people that... Um, come to see us in Grumeti, we'll usually choose um, at least two of the lodges or you can combine it even all three together. Um, we have some promotions that um, Candice will talk about in the end um, for combining the regions um, together and combining the lodges. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're like me and you just can't wait to get away to a nature sanctuary in Africa and recharge and heal from this crazy year, um, consider coming to see us. All our lodges are small. Um, we're generally quite busy during normal years, so advanced planning is usually required. Um, and Africa Endeavors um, knows our lodges inside and out and can definitely have, help you plan the perfect Singita adventure. So um, thanks, everybody. Great to see you. And thanks for tuning in today. Thanks so much, Christy. Oh my gosh, it was such an amazing overview. I know there's a lot of information there, but that's what we're here for as well. We work well with Christy. We work a lot with her. So if you guys have any questions in specific about them, we'll send through the 
through the um, recording and we can also help as well. Um, but also just kind of um, to just get, let, get you get really excited. We do have created incentive with Singita. So Christy's worked with us. So as she mentioned, we do kind of um, have a low season special. So both Christy and Candace did travel in January, which is considered low season, but you've heard their experiences. So it doesn't matter what time of year you're going. And if you are going to travel, let me just make sure I got this right from to Rwanda from November to May for three or more days uh, and visit multiple national parks. Um, you qualify for a discounted gorilla permit. So 30% off. Um, we'll work through you, uh, through it with other properties as well. So we'll send out this um, after the recording as well and then just reach out to us or your consultant for specific questions. Um, but I think that's it really. So just a lot on offer for Singita. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, just a bit, bit of our team. We're really lucky to have Christy join us and really give our the first hand view. And yes, cheers, Robert. Yep, big cheers for everyone joining us. Um, just quickly, I'll tell you for our next Travel Tuesdays, before we get into the question and answer portion, uh, it will be next uh, October 6th, so three weeks today, we'll send out another reminder, but we're going to go ahead and do another great location that is open for U.S. travelers, Islands of Tahiti. So let us know if you do have any specific questions, um, but otherwise we'll kind of, we'll um, try to get closer to the dates, talk a little bit more about that. But for now, um, I think let's get a, go ahead and do some Q&A. All right, everybody. Um, thanks again for joining in. Really appreciate it. Um, we've got a manageable group on here, so we're going to try something a little different instead of just talking at you. Um, I'm going to stop the presentation and you guys can all pop on. Everyone's using Zoom, um, so you know how this works. Uh, so we're just going to actually let you pop on and have a chat. The only things I ask you that if you're not asking a question or if you're not answering a question, like Audra, Christy, Candace, myself, Corinne, anybody that's been, we've got a fair amount of people that have been to uh, Rwanda and um, can answer some questions for you. We've all done a bunch of crazy things over there, as some of you probably know. We've got some even clients I know that I see on here that have been. So uh, I'm just going to take this presentation off. Just uh, ask you just to keep your microphone muted unless you want to have a chat. And then uh, just, again, want to say thanks uh, from the entire team at Africa Endeavors, Down Under Endeavors, and Singita. Thanks a lot for taking your time today. We appreciate it. And then uh, feel free to just go ahead and have a uh, have some chat. We'll, we'll talk through some things as the questions come up. Doug, maybe we should address the ones in the message. Yeah, I'm just going to say, so uh, Mr. Wolf has asked. We can all sit here and stare at each other. <laughs> yeah, so Tom, so Tom has asked, can you describe uh, what you see experience on a water safari versus a land safari? I, I assuming, I'm assuming that's about my experience at Akagera. Um, I wish I could remember the name of the lake. It is like 14 syllables. It's the longest name of a lake I've ever seen, but it is this huge, beautiful lake that borders the um, Rwanda and Tanzania. I mean, the experience on the boat is going to be, um, there's fishing options. You get to see big game from the water, like elephants who are coming up to drink at night, buffalo who are coming up. Um, and it's just also about like the little things, like there's beautiful papyrus lining the shores. You see the water lilies um, that the day and night lilies, all the bird life, like the jacanas and everything. It's, um, so it's just a quieter, slower safari. Um, and it's just a different way to experience, you know, things, land versus water. And it's nice to mix it up. I mean, I think all of us who have been on safari, you know, you, you don't want to be in a vehicle six days, 10 days in a row. Like it's nice to get out and do something a little bit different. You've actually done a few of those in Botswana, haven't you, Candace? Mm, yeah, Makoro and stuff. So it's a little bit different than Botswana, but it still has that same peaceful feeling. Um, it's a beautiful experience to do sundown or out in the water. You know, you just kind of drift. And then after we had that amazing um, sundown or water safari, that's when we had our leopard sighting. So it was incredible. And we had two really, we had two really good experiences, yeah. Doug, where we, the sound of the, people locals singing at night as they were bringing in or going out fishing or bringing in the catch just to hear the song was magnificent and then a baby elephant came down went underwater with just his little snout above the water and then all of a sudden you see his feet to the air he was doing somersaults in the water it was pretty cool 
Yeah, Queen Elizabeth National Park, which isn't too far from some of the places we've talked about from volcanoes, still a drive up into Uganda was, uh, I have never seen so many hippos in my life as what we saw just doing a, a few hours on, on the lake there. I've never seen that concentration uh, of wildlife in an area. And we just did the great migration too, but I've never seen so many hippos, thousands of them. Yeah, they'll um, pack it in. Yeah, and it's, um, it, it was crazy with elephants and well, it, was, it was just absolutely insane. So it's something interesting to break things up, which was great, like Candace mentioned. When you're in, the, when you're in these uh, moving from location to location and you're in a vehicle doing safari, it is really a great break. That's a good question, Tom. Um, another question from Mr. Wolf is, how long do people normally stay? Three nights a week? Candace, I'll let you handle this. Are you and Corinne? Um, well, I think it depends on what your objective is. I mean, I was there in Rwanda 10 nights and I was running around. So, and I covered pretty much the whole country. So it really just depends on, on how much you want to see and do. Um, three would be the minimum. I mean, really four, once you think if you're just doing gorillas and doing a stopover in Kigali, but, um, it's easy. It could easily be a two week destination. It just, it matters uh, about how quickly you want to move and you know what you want to see and do. Um, from Michelle, we have what is a range of costs? <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Here well, we go. <laughs> Singita <laughs> is not cheap. <laughs> no. um, this is not the Motel Six of Safari. I can tell I, you. <laughs> I'll say this about Rwanda. I know Paul Kagami was working closely with Botswana Tourism. Um, and they want to follow their their same, and Christy, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but from my understanding, their same concept that it's um, low threshold, high yield. So they want minimal impact, which means it's going to be a bit more expensive. But also with that, you don't ever feel like it's over touristed. You know, if you've been to the Mara and you're at a river sighting and there's a hundred different vehicles, like you just don't get that feeling. Even at the gorilla tracks, it's these private little intimate experiences and they don't, you know, the, in, my, in my limited experience there, they, you know, they wanna preserve their nature and the best way to do that is to limit the numbers and with that comes cost. So a range of costs, it's hard to say, you know, there's certainly more economical ways to, to do it. Um, but I would say with the um, with the lodges coming online, it's it's definitely more upper, upper market. It's not a budget destination. Um, you know, with gorilla permits now being fifteen hundred dollars a person, that you know that obviously adds a bunch of costs right at right at the beginning. And that's not for the habituation, right, Candace? That's just for no. The, they don't have the habituation in Rwanda, that's so the, that's, just for, that's just for your one hour of joy. <laughs> but it's worth it. It is. It is worth it. But um, but yeah, the destination, you know, it's expensive. But at the end of the day, like you know, your money is going. If you just look at the history of conservation in in Rwanda, you know, and the success story of the gorillas, you know, your money is going to a good place. It's not just you know, as we joke, like to some guy Swiss bank account, it's not there to make somebody wealthy. It's, it's there really for the conservation. That's a good question. Um, actually, falling onto that, do you want to talk about, because Africa works a little different than some of these places, and you just, you just uh, seg I kind of segued into that, Candace. Uh, Christy, you might be a good person to ask, when, you, when the money hits the ground over there, uh, can you explain the impact it has on the communities there and how the resources are used uh, from your experience. Yeah, so when you travel in Africa, generally in these models, especially like Rwanda or, you know, we're located in Gurmeti or like Candace was talking about Botswana, this, um, you know, high value, low impact tourism is really the goal here. You know, when you think about the more humans, the more vehicles um, that are on a piece of land is really um, hurts the land and hurts the wildlife. So um, when you travel in Africa, part of what you're paying for really is the conservation, the preservation of the land that you're on and the preservation of the wildlife species, but also the local communities. 
So um, the local communities will work very closely with the lodges, for example, um, and, you know, rely on the lodges. So they both live in harmony together and both the community and the lodge can, can both benefit um, from the lodge being there, not just creating jobs, but creating platforms for small business, for enterprise, to sell some of the local crafts through the markets, to set up farming co-ops, to buy produce, um, and to sort of grow their skill sets in the local communities. So everybody is really living in harmony um, and not really creating too much of an impact on the land, which really um, deters from the overall conservation efforts. So traveling in Africa, you've got to just sort of get in your brain that a percentage right off the bat is going to conservation. Um, it's going to community development and, you know, creating a sustainable platform is just a very different model than staying at a luxury hotel in Paris. Um, so, you know, it's just right. sort of a very, it's, it's traveling with a purpose, essentially. And then on top of it, you get to have some of the most incredible wildlife experiences and human experiences really on our planet, which is the whole icing on the cake, in my opinion. One, sure. of the, one of the questions that's come up, this is, this, uh, move on to the next question here as we're I'm just keep in mind on time here. This has been a question we've had pop up uh, on occasion here in the last couple of months uh, when Travel First uh, took a pause was, are they worried about the gorillas getting COVID? Is there a, a you know, has there been some, because there was some talk about limiting access into it, uh, into the gorillas. Do you, know, you want to, anyone want to take that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll give that, take a stab at that one. So um, there certainly was, um, you know, concern for that. And, Africa, many countries in Africa in general have um, a lot of experience with epidemics and, you know, management of, of disease control with the Ebola outbreak. Um, so the systems that were in place um, were pretty well managed, especially in countries like Rwanda, which is why um, Rwanda was one of the first countries on the continent to open the borders. So um, the rapid testing with getting the results and everything from managing with the double negative tests and then protocols to um, test you again if you're in the country for I think more than five days, an exit test and then wearing masks around Rwanda. So there's quite a lot that has gone into um, prevention and mitigation of the spread. And then in general in Rwanda, the case numbers um, is you got to also remember Rwanda is a small country with a small population as well. So the spread there was, um, was really never that bad and it was managed um, pretty well from the start. So um, they opened pretty confidently knowing that, you know, the gorillas are a really precious resource um, and, you know, so many, so much effort that's going on from, you know, the international community, from the guests, from travelers like you, from lodges um, to preserve their existence. So um, we feel that they've done a pretty great job in uh, sort of management of, uh, of the entry protocols there. And the last question I see pop up here is Michelle has asked, what accommodations are made for people who can't walk? And Michelle, I see you're still on here. You can unmute yourself if I, uh, if we don't get the answer to this, <laughs> what you're looking for. But I assume you mean uh, can't walk, uh, whether that's not walk far or not walk at all and are, are pretty limited mobility wise. Um, I know Rwanda is and in, in, there's a lot of, when you do guerrilla trekking, it's, it, it's, uh, I mean, it, it takes some effort. I know that and some of the accommodations are, you, you know, what was that one we stayed at, Corinne, that was, we had about 150, and I know they've changed it since then. We had about a 250 steps just to get up into the thing from the, uh, from the parking lot. So I know there's a, yeah, so being, you know, you had to be pretty physically 163 fit. steps. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, but if anybody wants to speak to that, that it, any, is there any accommodations there for people who might not be as mobile uh, or as spry as Corinne and Candace and Audra and Christy? Christy, I'm, do you want to talk a little bit about what was people who, yeah, we usually have multiple fitness levels. So some who do oh. want to trek in the group and then the other one may want to stay back if you have a multi-generational family. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, that's a really common request and not everybody, um, you know, is a big mountain hiker that comes to see us and trek with the gorillas. So there's three distances, if you will, for treks. Like you can go for an easy trek, a medium trek, and a hard trek. And you can, of course, never manage where the gorillas are going to be, but there are some families that are low lying and they stay right 
next to the port parks borders generally. Um, and you can usually, there's of course no guarantees, it's wildlife, but you can usually find them in five minutes, 15 minutes. Um, I have some friends that did one of the low lying families and they found them in under five minutes and they said they didn't even really feel like they, they worked for it. They just walk in the park and there they are. Um, so you can certainly do that. And then um, concessions can be made as well for, um, for you to get carried. Um, and at the name of kind of like a basket you know with the poles and the name escapes me right now but you can actually book that experience as well um so the easy trek or like the getting carried route are two ways to do it and then anybody that treks regardless if you do the easy trek or the hard trek always hire a porter um the porters are a godsend um they make their living from you know carrying your stuff but they're also going to help you sometimes it gets muddy and slippery and they'll grab you by the hand and make sure you're not sliding down the hill take pictures for you and um and they're just generally fun to be around and talk to and you could the porters i think charge ten dollars um for the day of porter services um, for getting you around the park. So lots of different, um, lots of different experiences can be had for varying fitness levels or willingness to hike. I mean, some people just don't like to hike. So you certainly yeah. don't have to do the hard trek where you climb right up the mountain in the slippery rainforest if you don't want to. And Michelle, we did that closer hike. We did one far hike and then one close hike. And the nice thing was, is the closer hike, you walked through the farming community a lot more. The kids were running up to us and talking with us and trying to uh, learn how to say our names. And then as we, we would sit and have a break and rest a little bit more. And so you get a walking stick also, which is fantastic. But the porters are so important because you're supporting the local community. You are giving the young kids a job. And so they love helping you. They're passionate about helping you and working on their English is exceptional. It's beautiful. But the nice thing was, it was 15 minutes. My mom has a very sore knee. She was absolutely fine. And it was just that she didn't miss out on that experience. But then the next day left us when we did the harder hikes. So we can certainly accommodate with mobility issues or whatever you are feeling at the time for sure. And I think just for the accommodation in the other areas, I will say in the young way, the chimp tracking is very difficult. So that's, that's like, sli I always, I don't know, romancing the stone, if anyone's seen that movie, I always, that I basically did that on my last girl track, but that's also like chip tracking the young way where you're just like sliding down this mudslide in in the jungle. Um, but the accommodation itself was even in Akagera, um, was very mobility friendly. It's just a matter of like what activities you want to do when you're there. And just to mirror that, the the gorilla tracking they do, I think, try and make it as accessible as possible to to as many people who want to do it. And then uh, Diane has asked a very, very, very good question, which is, do you need to isolate if you go between Tanzania and Rwanda? Christy, that's you. <laughs> you don't have to. So right now, the way that it works, um, normally in normal times, if there's not a pandemic, you would usually go to Tanzania first, do your you know safari experience in the Serengeti, and then go to Rwanda and end with the gorillas. But right now, with the way that the testing protocols are working, Go to Rwanda first, if you wanna go soon while we're still in this whole COVID mess. Go to Rwanda first, um, because it's a lot more difficult to get a test in Tanzania. So when you get your test before you leave home, five days before your departure, you take it, you get into Rwanda, you get the second test when you arrive in Rwanda. And then if you're staying for less than three or four days, um, you take your negative test that you get from Rwanda, you get it to enter Tanzania to cross the border, and then you're home free from there. Um, if you stay for longer than four or five days in Rwanda, there are testing sites set up around to get a test, another test in Rwanda, and they've just knocked it out of the park with their testing and quick results in Rwanda. So you can get another one there if you need to and then take it into Tanzania. But right now, that's the best sequencing of events. M Michelle has also followed up with a question, uh, the mobility, could a scooter work there? Um, hmm. No, not so much. It's, 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 it's imagine that, you know, hiking in a, in a national park in a mountain, it gets, it does rain a lot. It's misty a lot. It's a rainforest. So it's also quite muddy. So um, unfortunately, no, not for, not for the gorilla trekking. Mr. Bradford, nice to see you on here. Good to see you, mate. Wish we were in person instead of this. <laughs> What's a comfortable time to do both Rwanda, Tanzania? 10 days on the ground, be good. That's a good 
at least I would say, um, I wouldn't do less than maybe four or five nights in the Serengeti and then Rwanda. I would, I mean, if you're staying with us at Kwatanda, I definitely wouldn't do less than three nights. So yeah, 10 days. And then there's a great chance that you're going to want to bounce around um, somewhere else, you know, around, around the countries as well. Uh, I'll turn that one over to Candice. I'm sure she's got a lot of insight on what else you would, you would. Yeah. Bring. I mean, just to mirror what Christy said, I, I just think, I think, Last time I was in Tanzania, we spent about four nights. I was really roughing it at Singida. So, <laughs> um, and you know, if you if you think about that, on top of that, you've got a couple nights in Kigali, and then to add on gorilla trucking, um, and obviously there's other places in Tanzania and Rwanda. So, it, you know, again, it, I would say ten days would be the minimum, and then if there's other things you want to see and do, you really. You, it's doable, but you know you just have to be mindful that it is Africa, and it's not like there's a, a direct flight between. <laughs> um, well, I guess there sort of is, but it, you still have to go through customs. It's just not as easy as it as it is here in the state. So um, I would say ten nights on ground minimum, um, especially if you want to add other destinations. You should really think about ex extending the trip a bit. And then Candice, just to top on for what Robert's asking there, if you had one time to pick, you know, first and second choice of time of year to go, what would be it? For the dual country? I mean, I think then you really have to pick high season, which is great migration. And, you know, then you have, the, you're in the dry season in Rwanda. Um, just because that's, if it's your own, if it's your own one and only time, not that that ever happens in Africa, but if you think it's going to be your one and only time, that's probably what I would pick. Um, if you're, but January, I think is also great. Like Christy, I'm, you were there in January, dual destination. It's, you're not picking, if you don't really, if you're not into the great migration, then January is also a good time. I mean, I had fantastic weather. Um, oh, so we were there in December. It was fantastic. Yeah. Also. You're not paying high season rates. And, and for like, those who don't know, when is high season for those who don't know? Christy, I'll let you answer that one. The summer months. So if you're looking at Rwanda and Tanzania especially, um, June, July, August is high season. Um, I will say the beauty of coming to see us um, at Singida Grumeti is that if you've heard about, you know, the Serengeti Mara ecosystem and lots of vehicles on a siding and lots of general vehicle traffic, You'll never have that with us because we're the private concession there. So it's just the Singita Lodges. Um, so you could theoretically come and travel with us and stay with us in high season and not have to deal with all of the other vehicles competing for that leopard that's 500 feet away <laughs> and trying to get a picture of it with your iPhone. But yeah, June, July, August are, um, are definitely peak season. And um, you know, a lot of people are going to try to chase uh, the migration coming through Grumeti uh, during June and July, especially. Christy, just to probably piggyback on that, just a touch on it, can you give a one minute, take me there for what it is to be in the great migration moment? Yeah, you got to definitely like wildebeests. <laughs> <laughs> if you like wildebeests, you would be surrounded by wildebeests in every direction and really the, the holy grail of the great migration is a river crossing. So that really is what, you know, most people's absolute bucket list wildlife dream would be to chase a river crossing during the migration. Um, and we, did, we didn't talk about it today, but we do have one very small camp called Mara River that's right on the Mara River. So around October-ish, um, is the best time to go and chase that um, that river crossing where the wildebeest will cross the border from Tanzania into Kenya and cross that Mara River there. So, and if you've seen any wildlife specials, you'll know that the river crossing is so coveted because wildebeest are actually walking through the river and the lions are waiting on the other side trying to get a meal and the crocodiles are under the water trying to pull them under and it's just absolute madness. Um, a very in, a major wildlife spectacle on our planet, to say the least. Candice, what about you? Favorite memory from migration? I, well, I, will, I will have to say, I'm going to go off and be like, the migration wasn't my favorite thing I've ever done. Now, I loved staying at Singida, but I just, I liked, like, I liked the elegant animals like giraffe and the elephant, and they sort of get pushed off during migration. So, 
Um, while it, you know, I mean, it is a spectacle and I've done it twice now and it, it's unbelievable. Um, I would say I just, I kind of just prefer normal safari time. I like it walking safaris. I like to mix it up a little bit, but, um, but I do think for those river crossings, that is sort of a check the box once in a lifetime um, experience. But I, you know, you, it is nice to sort of get away from it and just see everything else when it's, when it's like, if you go in January, you can just experience the Serengeti. You don't necessarily have the pressure of like, I need to see this river crossing. Um, you can just enjoy the environment. So not to be a buzzkill on the great migration. It is amazing, <laughs> but not at all. I'm, I'm always question. happy to be in Africa. I don't even care why. <laughs> and we've talked a little bit about mobility issues. We do have, you know, the silverbacks, but the golden monkeys, for those who may not want the hard hikes, are so entertaining to be running through the bamboo rainforest. And they are also located in Rwanda. They were fantastic. The little chipmunk cheeky faces and with the sun coming through the bamboo is and just hundreds of them running through really quickly. It's, it's just entertaining, especially for all ages. So I really enjoyed that with not a difficult track. And that was in volcanoes too, right, When when we did that? Yeah. yeah. And that and was that's a much easier day than, than the, what was supposed to be 15 minutes and turned into six hours of check, uh, chasing one of the gorilla families down. But the monkeys were, I mean, we weren't in there very long and we found them it was pretty quick. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. You were there in, Chris and I were there in February. And oh, what we saw. Hi there. And what we saw were baby animals. I mean, lots and lots of baby animals, some that had just been born, like that were a day old. Um, I mean, everything you can imagine, you know, from baby lions to baby wildebeest and, you know, zebras and everything. Now, this is Tanzania. Um, yeah, that's, the calving, that's a great time for calving. It was absolutely. And Candace, you did a wonderful, wonderful job for us. Oh, just, I didn't pay her to say that. No, you, you did not. And we had the best guide. I can just tell you, we had the best guide ever. So I would tell anyone to go to Tanzania if you can go. It's amazing. And mobility is not a problem because you're riding a safari vehicle. So, <laughs> that so is, there is no problem with that. Tanzania is a bit easier. Thanks, yes, it is. Man. Sure. And you almost have to be fit to do some of these safaris. The way you're out for, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours a day sometimes in these safari vehicles. Like, man, you need to actually, you know, it's fun to sit there, though. I know what you're saying, but it's, um, yeah, yeah it's, uh, Tanzania is pretty special. I think Michelle had another question about testing, cost of tests. Are tests free? Um, Michelle, I can send you this information, unless, Christy, unless you have it off the top of your head. I have it written down somewhere. $50, I believe. Um, $60. So $50 for the test, and then there's a $10 fee. So I believe each test in Rwanda will be $60 upon entry. And I don't remember if we touched on this, but um, there are, there's a, outside of the airport in Kigali, and then Musanze as well, there's there are testing stations, so you don't, if your volcanoes is your last stop, you don't have to worry about coming back to Kigali to get your test. You can do it after your gorilla track and it'll be ready for you before you depart because you do need to show that um, negative test before you board your plane. And I know this stuff has been changing a lot and changes as we go and we're, we try to stay on top of this as much as we possibly can, having wonderful people like Christy help us out and the tourism boards have been um, trying to keep everybody informed on what the, as the decisions change and, uh, you know, moving forward. But Rwanda and Tanzania seem to be doing a pretty doggone good job of this. I'll give them that. Uh, any other questions that anybody has? I know there's the chat box is open, but you can also unpop yourself off a of mute and ask here as well. Hi, Francia. Nice to see you on here. <laughs> All right. Going twice. <laughs> I think that's a wrap. But you guys know you have all of our information. We will send up follow up emails um, as well after this. But I'll just say for myself, thank you for everyone for joining us. And thank you again to Christy for your time. It was so great having you here. Um, it was super informative. And obviously, we love Singita. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thanks for having me on Africa Endeavors.
Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Cheers, guys. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Yeah. Start to see some people popping on here now. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.